It's another beautiful Sunday afternoon. This is Robin Mines. Welcome. My name is Abu Kyle Butcher, and thanks a lot for joining us. Um, it's the second week since the relaxation of the lockdown in Lagos, Abuja, and Ogun State. And Mr. President, in his broadcast at the time, had said that he was going to review uh, the situation to see if uh, an extension or a re if and a renewed lockdown would be warranted. Um, for a lot of people, people are not sure how this is going to work out. Um, the cases uh, of infected Nigerians with the coronavirus have continued to rise. The numbers are crazy across the states, especially Lagos. Um, and it has not gotten any better since the lockdown was relaxed. So most people are wondering, do we need to go back to a lockdown for things to sort of settle down? Or how do we manage things with the way things are right now? Um, creeping very closely to 6,000 cases across the country. Kano State has been on a two-week lockdown, um, which was imposed by Mr. President. Um, I think it should be ending next week. Uh, this week's a bigger part, and we're not sure if the lockdown will be extended because the case in Kano have also not been particularly um, impressive either. Um, virtually every state in the country has at least one case, uh, I think, barring Kogi State and Cross River States uh, for now. Um, but there's a lot that comes with the lockdown or the lack of it and just the entire situation that um, the coronavirus has brought uh, to Nigerians. And the hugest, the biggest part of it is hunger and poverty and just the implications on the economy. So many businesses have shut down, probably never to come back again after the virus is even cleared. Some, a lot more more would need uh, the support of government or the help of government uh, to be able to stand their feet. But there are individuals like you and I who are just unable to get by daily. Uh, getting a, a meal is tough enough for a lot of them. And a lot of uh, private individuals have set up foundations and organizations to support Nigerians who need help. But government has also tried to do their part. And um, we know that um, there's so many programs that the federal government has set up to support Nigerians in this time. The conditional cash transfer program um, has been one of them. It's received mixed feelings from a lot of people with regards to its implementation and how uh, widespread it is or not widespread enough that it is because most people think uh, the concentration of, uh, of you know, the, those who are benefiting from this seems to be in a particular part of the country. Um, we're going to be speaking with someone who should know a lot about that and um, hopefully give us a better insight into what the federal government is doing, what it will be doing going forward with regards to, you know, just the safety or the social safety nets that have been provided for Nigerians. I'm joined now by Yowa by Akbera, I believe, uh, from our Abuja studios um, to help us dissect some of these issues. Good day. How are you doing, sir? Um, thank you, Abuka. Thank you for having me. Yes, um, so like I said, a lot of people are still very confused as to the implementation of this conditional cash transfer. Um, just as quickly as you can, explain to us how this works, who's benefiting from it, and who is eligible to benefit from this. Okay, those who are benefiting from the cash transfer are the poor and vulnerable that have been identified by their communities. They are taken out of uh, mind from a social register, a social register that is owned and developed by the state and the state government, uh, domiciled at the Ministry of Planning for each of the states that work with their local government teams to develop the social register. And the local government teams uh, meet uh, with community members and community leaders and set the community together. After due sensitization, the community then identifies those who are poor and vulnerable amongst them. They are then registered into the uh, social register. But of course, only after the communi uh, community have identified them and uh, the communities who will sign off on the list of identified poor and vulnerable. This identified poor and vulnerable list that has been signed up by the community, uh, a list will be left with them at the community level. And then another list will be taken by our colleagues at the local government level who will go back and register uh, this uh, poor uh, and vulnerable people that have been identified by their communities. Now, these people come into the social register. At the moment, the social register is in all 36 states of the Federation and Abuja, uh, with a total of 3.3 million poor and vulnerable households made up of 13.8 million individuals. Now, the cash transfer program then mines from this uh, social register. The cash transfer program or, uh, on its own, it's also managed at the state level. 
In every state, there is a state caste transfer office that has been established under the state government. And then what they do is to mine from the social register, and they go back to these communities and then register the people into the cash transfer program. Now, for the, for the benefit of all of us, um, for Nigeria, the, not everyone in the social register is entitled to cash transfer only the poor of the poorest. So within the cash transfer itself, there are certain parameters that are applied to then categorize these poor and vulnerable households from the poor to the poorest. Now the cash transfer pay the poor of the poorest from this social register. And with these numbers uh, for now, the government of, of the 3.3 million, uh, we are paying 1 million, and we are still uh, enrolling uh, others uh, as we speak. So it's a daily um, uh, um, thing that gets updated, and we are hoping that in the May-June um, payment round that we are preparing for, uh, we will be able to up the numbers from 1 million and heading towards 2 million. Now, this is the cash transfer, and those are those who are able to access this cash transfer. Now, I mean, we live in a country where we know that um, there's been stories confirmed on so many levels in the past with regards to things as, as annoying as ghost workers in the civil service. And that is a place that's supposed to have some structure. So you can understand Nigerians being skeptical about a list of poor people, especially not understanding when it was compiled and who's on this list and how things are even verified. Um, how, how, do you, how do you work with the state governments to ensure that these lists are properly verified? And then Secondly, I think most importantly, you, you are doing a cash transfer to about a million Nigerians. I mean, it's, it's good enough that you're doing something at least. But for a country that's, whether we like it or not, the, the poverty capital of the world, the statistics of the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics of our country released just a month ago showed that over 80 million Nigerians live below the poverty line. So that's literally just a drop in the ocean, isn't it? Um, you see, tackling poverty is multidimensional. Um, you want to look at the entire human capital development indexes, uh, index. Um, you want to look at health and health infrastructure. You look at agriculture. You look at education and education infrastructure. And you look at um, uh, jobs uh, and creation of jobs. You look at uh, small scale businesses. Um, all of this come together. Uh, cash transfer in itself will not. Uh, um, be a cover for all. But in itself, it's a very strategic investment by government that uh, will stimulate demand. And by stim stimulating demand in our communities, it will then drive in the long run production and production activities. We all know that once uh, demand is high, supply has to meet it. And to meet supply, you've got to increase uh, production. And by increasing production down the line, you are in 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 encouraging businesses to, to, to flourish. And by businesses flourishing, we also mean employing more people. So by that uh, move, you are also able to uh, tackle some of the other problems, including employment. Now, for every one naira you give uh, a poor and vulnerable person out there in form of cash transfer, uh, evidence shows that there is a one naira 30 kobo return on that investment, which goes to say that there is a multiplier effect in investing uh, in cash transfer. But that is not really the argument from your, your point of view or your question. Um, the data released by Bureau of Statistics put absolute poverty value at 40%. 40% translates to like 80-something million people. That is it. Um, then how is government systematically tackling this? The cash transfer is just one out of the many um, uh, strategies that the government uh, is trying to put in place to effectively tackle the question of poverty. But it has to all come together. So the other day we had the vice president uh, on the move to create more jobs, to create about a thousand jobs in every local government. Um, you had uh, stories uh, the, just two, two or three days ago, the vice president came up to say um, on, on the small scale industries and small scale businesses and opening up. So all of this will have a way to converge um, in, in alleviating poverty. But <clears throat> to, for the immediate, 
The cash transfer has been existing uh, since uh, 2016. That the cash transfer office was established along with um, the office that I oversee, which is a National Social Safety Net Coordinating Office, NASCO, uh, to begin to systematically put in place some of the structures that will help define who the poor and vulnerable are, where they are, what they are. And we all recall in Mr. President's uh, democracy speech last year, he did say, now we have a list of poor and vulnerable. We know them, we know who they are, where they are, and where they reside. This is what the social register is. He was talking about the social register. But it is a continuous process. It is a process that is ongoing. Uh, we just started the social register in itself as a national social register. It's, it's around two to three, two and a half years old as it is now, uh, when we began to put it together as a national social register. Yet we are 3.3 million. And we are developing the richer every day. So as we speak, the teams uh, on tomorrow again, because today is weekend, tomorrow the teams, the various state teams and their local government counterparts are still in the field uh, collecting data, collecting information of these poor and vulnerable people and registering them on onto the field. You recall that two weeks ago when Mr. President made an uh, announcement, he did say the social register was 2.6 million. Today it is 3.3 uh, um, 3 million and still counting. So it's growing by the day. And so so hopefully, in no distant future, we'll be hitting uh, our numbers. A global best practices and global experience will tell us that it takes a while to develop a social register of poor and vulnerable. And there are a lot of targeting mechanisms to do this. For Nigeria, we adopt the community-based targeting system, wherein the community decide who are poor and vulnerable. So it's a growing concern. Um, we know it's a hard hit, and government is doing all within its power uh, to see that help uh, come to everyone. Uh, Something I want to find out about, uh, we, we find that a lot, of, a lot of states have also complained, right? Um, there was a lot of complaints from state governments. Um, yes, I know that not, not every state is equally poor. Some states, of course, are doing better than others. But some states are also, were also more affected with the lockdown than others. While some states were on lockdown, other states were receiving the conditional cash transfer even when they were not locked down. Uh, what was the criteria used in choosing what, uh, who benefits from this at a time like this when we're in peculiar times? And are these complaints about states even valid? Okay, so the cash transfer itself wasn't really a palliative. You won't say uh, it is not at the advent of the pandemic that the government decided to do a cash transfer program, even though that is part of a, uh, a COVID-19 um, intervention that government is thinking of. But the cash transfer that has, was being paid or is still being paid now has been in existence since 2016. And we have been moving into states as states get set and state gets um, their structures in place. So uh, we know we, we operate a federation. So for, uh, for, for the social register to be built in any state, the state government enters a memorandum of understanding with us. And that memorandum of understanding puts some responsibility on the state. Uh, for instance, to establish an office in the Office of Planning, to deploy civil servants who are qualified to man those positions, and also to provide minimal uh, office furnishing and all of that. Some states were quite proactive in doing this and were on board very early. Others very sorry to cut you there, you were. were very sorry, sorry to cut you. Sorry to cut you there. Sorry, because I'm asking this because I mean I understand that you've been working since 2016, but we're talking about this now in the context of the fact that we are in very peculiar times. What has the cash transfer done to help Nigerians in the pandemic? Or is it not relevant in this time to ask that question? Very re relevant. And I agree with you, Hadley, very uh, relevant. And the cash transfer in itself is being paid to all the states that are on the program regardless of lockdown or not. So during the lockdown, the cash transfer was flagged by the Honorable Minister uh, Sadia Omar Farouk of the Ministry of uh, Humanitarian Affairs, whom we work under in, in Kuali. So Kuali was actually locked down, but the cash transfer uh, was, um, was paid there. And also in Kano, uh, cash transfer was ongoing in Kano, uh, and all the other states that are now uh, under the, uh, on the cash transfer. Lagos, uh, Ogun, and the other states as well, uh, we come up uh, this next payment round that we're preparing to start paying. So, you know, the, I mean, there's a saying that I know you believe in, whatever is worth doing is worth doing well. Um, 
we know that the federal government is paying, I think, 5,000 naira a month for the next four months uh, to families um, in this time. Um, you've talked about the fact that just about a million families are getting this out of 80, 80, over 80 million who need it. Even the bigger picture out of it, 200 million Nigerians who are affected by this, whether we like it or not. Would you say you are doing this well? And is it worth it? Um, I would say it's worth it because evidence abound on how impactful cash transfer program is even here in Nigeria, the one that we're working with. We have a number of success stories where lives have been changed. We have a lot of success stories where people have started just with those 5,000 naira and have invested uh, in little, little businesses and now they are taking care of their families uh, regardless of whether it is paid or not. So it is really successful. Uh, as a program, evidence abound everywhere. But now, are we doing enough? Yes, we will do a lot more, and there is a, r a room for uh, doing much more. And the federal government, under uh, the leadership of um, uh, the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management, and Social Development, and the Minister Sadia Omar Farouk, has been very clear on this uh, um, on this direction by putting very clearly. Uh, some of the systems and some of the interventions that will reach uh, millions of Nigerians. Cash transfer is one of them, but the homegrown school feeding program has quite quickly been readjusted into uh, dry food rations, and 3.1 million families are targeted to receive those dry food rations that started uh, this week uh, in Abuja. We extend to Lagos, Ogun, um, and, and Kano for the immediate and to the other states. So all of these measures are measures to reach poor uh, Nigeria. The government, uh, the, pre the president also announced uh, the monetarium for those who were already on uh, market money uh, and other small-term loans under the GIP program uh, for, 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 for three, four months. These are all aimed to supporting Nigerians and helping Nigerians uh, in this time of pandemic. Of course, more is being planned, more is being worked out. The um, structures and logistics are just being worked out to start developing the rapid response register that will be targeting the urban poor. These are people who have been made, uh, who have been made vulnerable, who are vulnerable or uh, made poor out of the result of the pandemic, wherein and they are now able to go back to their daily jobs, uh, daily businesses to earn their uh, daily income that they earn either through brick laying, um, supporting on construction sites, uh, daily transport or selling uh, by the roadside. Now, these people are vulnerable and they are not only vulnerable now, they are made poor, uh, if we want to use that word. Uh, but the federal government is working on it. So they want to uh, get these people uh, onto this rapid response uh, register, and then they immediately uh, find support for them as they need it. So, I mean, like I said, I mean, we all know what's going on in the world. This is not something that's peculiar to Nigeria. Um, even some of the greatest capitalist countries in the world have turned to social welfare to help their citizens. Um, so Nigeria is not, is not in a different situation here. I, I guess my question is, um, with regards to what you're doing and looking at the bigger picture, it might not necessarily be a social welfare question for you, but what is going to happen going forward for, for the Nigerian economy? Because, like I said, a lot of people are out of work. A lot of people are going to be out of business. Most businesses are going to, not going to come back after this. And you work in the social welfare sort of space in government. Are there any plans for entrepreneurs who would need support after this? How do they access these funds even? Does, does the government even have the funds for people to access? Thank you very much, and it's good that you say this might not really be a question for me. So I'm very happy answering this question as a Nigerian. Um, I would say yes. Yes, that's why the president was very proactive in establishing the uh, Economic Recovery Committee headed by the vice president. This committee has been working, and we've seen some of their uh, briefings uh, uh, every now and then on, on TV, and the vice president has come out to clearly uh, tell Nigerians where we need to go. We need to open up our economy. We need to invest more in small-scale uh, businesses. We need to create jobs. And by, th by that, the various ministries have been given very clear mandates. And I'll talk about the ministry where I work, the humanitarian uh, 
uh, we can't affairs <laughs> ministry. The minister has also been. We can't, we can't go into details now, Ewa, unfortunately. All of us. Yeah. yeah, sorry, we can't go into all the details of the ministries, but I mean, I, I think I get the picture you're trying to paint there. Thank you very much and continue to do the great thing you do. Please make sure you're doing it well because a lot of Nigerians need your support and the support of government. Thanks for joining us today. We'll Thank take a break now and be right back. Please don't go away. Welcome back now. Um, something we've talked about on the show before that I think is important that we'll continue to talk about is the, um, the other effect of being locked down, which is uh, domestic violence. And um, we've had reports across the world of a rise in domestic violence uh, with couples who are, quote unquote, stuck together because of the lockdown, uh, occasioned by, by, of course, the coronavirus uh, outbreak. And um, th there's not a lot of attention being paid to that now because everybody's talking about this one virus while people are generally living in fear and pain and sometimes even getting killed because they're stuck with partners that um, have refused to understand that, okay, these are times that you need to be more tolerant. And um, Nigeria, of course, is no exception. We've seen a few of the stories online, uh, in newspapers and in the media of people who have you know, been battered by their partners uh, in the last couple of weeks as a result of being locked down together. So it's something we want to explore, how people can be of help or seek help in a time like this. And I'm being joined now by the Executive Director of MediaCon, Princess Olufemi Kayode, uh, to talk about this. Uh, Princess, I don't know if you can hear me. How are you doing today? I can hear you. I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for Absolutely. thanks for joining me. Yes, um, I, I did have a, a guest on your show a couple of weeks ago, uh, Jerome, and we're talking about the same issue. I know the issue of statistics and data came up a lot, and it's something that we don't tend to talk about or keep uh, a lot of in Nigeria. Um, we heard news in Paris about a tripling of reported cases of domestic violence in the last couple of months because of the lockdown. Same thing in countries like South Africa, and I think Mexico as well. It's happening everywhere in the world. And it's, it would be strange to think that Nigeria would be any different. Do we have any idea how bad things have been in the last couple of weeks? Okay, um, I'm also in the forefront because um, my organization, Media Concern Initiative, also have helplines. As of this morning, I was still receiving calls. Um, and we were managing damages going on during the crisis. Women were battered by their husbands, um, children were beaten, and all of that. So it is actually bad. But in terms of numbers, numbers will be an issue in terms of, of course, we talk about data in our country, it's still, it's still an issue. But then, um, I think within Lagos State, because everybody works together, there was a lot of collaborations going on together because NGOs could not step out to do, you know, the assistance that could be even given ordinarily. So we had to work with the state, which was the, the um, domestic and sexual violence response team of the state, was actually managing a bit of all of that, including the police. Although, of course, they could not really arrest most people, particularly during the lockdown, people couldn't be arrested. So that also put a lot of women in very funny situation because, okay, you've made your report, so how could the man be, you know, picked up? There were some who were a bit afraid that the state was, you know, calling them up to say, oh, you're beating your wife. And so some of the women were saved. But there were some that was really bad that they had to really either move the woman out of the environment because the man could not be arrested because of the COVID um, pandemic, which we know that social distancing and all of that could not happen within, you know, cells or, or prisons. So it's really bad and it's still bad you know it's still bad it's yeah. still there that, that that's, is a little troubling, or more than a little even troubling, um, the fact that people could not be arrested. And I can understand why you might not want to have contacts, you know, in a time like this. But, I mean, if someone is in danger, why is arrest not possible? And how frequent was this, this situation you found with, with the reports you got? I think the issue was basically when, you know, COVID... SGBV is, is, is already a worldwide pandemic before COVID breakout. It was a pandemic that we were not even managing as best as we could. So with COVID, when they were making the emergency meetings, there was no gender specific, you know, um, 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 uh, portions 
you know, in, in, in all those meetings, you know, in how to make sure people are not infected. It was all about infection, infection, and other social issues were not really put on the table for emergency meeting, which is why it's so important that every sector needed to be part of it. And so that's why it seemed like we, when we talk about no arrest, so what are we going to do? So there will have been, you know, brainstorming ahead to say, okay, fine, so what are the things that will come that will hit us at this time? Which is what we say about planning and preparation. Yes, COVID met us, nobody was prepared, but then there still has to be planned on how to maintain safety of every citizen. And that was not it, because even those who could call, NGOs who could support, could not pick up anybody because they were not among those who were given consideration to have um, the, the special status to move around. So you could not even go pick a woman who was beaten to stupor. So there are there were those kind of situations there. Yeah. And then even here, yeah, so those are things that were not considered. That, okay, fine. Is it that the state provides some vehicle and the different strategic locations of the state, by that agree, you could do, you know, all those as it's a jar, and then, so not everybody is in Ikeja, or, you know, to say, okay, fine, there'll be a vehicle if there's an emergency, whether through the state's um, hotline, if you, if you call UNGOs receiving calls, transfer to so-and-so and let them move, and a tax force will still be designated to assist in this situation. So we did not have that. So uh, I'm talking of Lagos now. I'm using yeah. Lagos now. So, so if I'm using Lagos as a standard, so you can imagine what will be happening in other states. In other states. In the so I mean, so I know that stand out. Yes. Yeah, I know a lot of a lot of countries um, had to have like special arrangements in times like this when they realized that it was a spike in numbers uh, of domestic violence. I know some countries provided hotels as safe spaces for the time being for people to move in there, whether it was a woman or man or child or whoever, to stay there while you know this virus has been handled. So that at least this is a safe space for you. There were safe words that were even introduced. If you make a phone call, you sound like you're ordering a pizza, but the, the person at the other end knows what you're talking about. You know, did we have any of those sort of arrangements there, even if it's with NGOs aside from government? Yeah, the interesting thing was for, for, for NGOs who, had, who have shelters, the issue was really getting people, moving people. That was the issue. Yes. We had people who still had, who had places. So it was actually, but they during the lockdown. Now we have a bit of, you know, um, there's an ease of lockdown. So there's a bit of, you know, um, it's better. But during the lockdown proper, it was difficult. There was no spe special status given for those who would respond to GBV. There was none. So there was no way we could move in. Media was given special status, um, firebed and certain services, um, food people selling. But this particular issue was not considered yeah. on the table. So to, to, and then when you even call a police officer, they don't want to send their police officers to anybody's house. It was, it was serious. Nobody yeah. wants to go to anybody's house. I don't want to say, I don't want to, I, I don't want to be infected. I don't know where I'm going, which is true. I mean, everybody had to be, to feel secure and safe. So yeah. there were no arrangements, which I'm saying that it's something that we need to be looking at that when we are having preparations for meetings, whether for crisis or for any intervention in the country, we need to sit and have a gender specific, you know, um, um, inclusion into it, which means we're thinking of women, we're thinking of children, we're thinking of the existing problems. Because being confined, you know, becomes a forced confinement with people who are also uncertain some men were not even violent before. So not all women had violated, you know, a violent men, you know, that could hit. And we're only talking about BT. We're talking about sexual violence. We're talking about wives who are being raped by their husbands. Excuse me, I don't want to do that. He's going to have his way, whether or not she wants it. And children that are watching their parents being battered and children are being molested. Sibling abuse is going on. Sexual abuse between children, siblings are going on. So people are confined in homes. And some of those parents are even, and then you're talking about uncertainty of job. Nobody, the bank is not sure it's going to, is, is, is coming back out of COVID and having a job. Imagine a bank announcing that some percent of people are going to, people are already, there's pandemonium already in the minds so, of people. So it's here's. Stress. So here's what I want to ask now, because, I mean, it's, there's so much, like you said, a lot is happening <laughs> with regards to spouse, even with children and all of that. But yeah. so, I mean, some states are still under a lockdown. Places like Kano, I know Rivers is still very strict with theirs. Some states might go back into a lockdown, depending on how things pan out in the coming weeks. What should people in situations like that now do? I mean, what, what should you be 
thinking about doing if you find yourself in, you know, in an abusive situation under a lockdown or a partial lockdown where you know that, okay, help might not be as easily accessible as it would be in the past? Um, there are still numbers. In fairness to, to um, um, people who are working in this space, there was a lot going on during... So there are numbers. Social media is... I mean, numbers are on social media. You can call this, you can call this. And we're still... I mean, I still receive calls from uh, across the nation. And then we still call somebody else who is in a bad dawn, or who is in a your, who is in um, um, emo, to say, okay, fine, there are people over there. So there is a way we were still struggling and trying to make sure people were safe. So there are numbers to call. And there are also, you see, prevention. There are also professional counselors and therapists numbers available across the nation who are actually interfering in reducing gender-based violence in sense of anger management therapies are going on online. So access to those numbers, access to, you know, it's just a click for somebody online or call somebody who will tell you, okay, you can call this number. People have called. People are calling. Oh, someone gave me your number. Oh, I googled online. I found this number. So it is available. Numbers are available across the nation who are receiving and helping and making sure that people are still being, I mean, the best we could do in the situations. Some lives have been saved. Some homes are, are managing the situation in terms of the husband agreeing to, to, to cancel and call a number. And some men who are realizing that oh, hey, I, may, I, may, I may do more harm, I need help. So the essence here is for the men who know that, for the men or women, let's not say it's only men, or women who are finding themselves that they can't, you know, can't control you know, their anger and the outbursts, there are lines to call. For those who are overstressed, because sometimes it's even just stress, it's not stress, you could hit your child out of, you know, over anxiety and out of your, your capacity to cope with a lot of things happening around you. So it's not just, it's also about prevention and also response. And I think most states, yeah, yeah, most states, most state response teams are helpful. Working, everybody's working, there's a lot of collaboration going on, so there is help still available at different levels. Thank you very much for wrapping it up there nicely because, I mean, it's very important that people know that there's still help out there. Like you said, social media, there's so many people to reach out to. Reach out to someone if you don't have any number to call and someone might actually have uh, help come to you. Thanks a lot for all the good work you do and please, may everybody please stay safe. We're going to take a very short time out and be right back. Please don't go away. All right, welcome back. Um, we are going to keep talking about the coronavirus and um, there's a lot to keep on wrapping. It's one of those situations where you have so many questions and you get so many answers, but it also feels like you're not getting enough information because we're learning about the virus and you know how to cope with it as we go along. But I'm going to be joined now by a comedian and a, uh, an online sensation, um, Real Worry Picking, who's going to be talking about who's going to be joining us as we go along, um, waiting for her to join us. But there's a lot that's happening, of course, with the coronavirus. And I just wanted to use this opportunity to, I know we've heard this so many times, but you can never hear it enough about the things that are very important to, to do or you sort of adhere to so that you stay safe. Of course, we've heard a lot about the need to wear a mask. Um, some people think it's a fashion statement all of a sudden. Some people wear their masks covering their mouth and leaving their nose open. The whole idea is to cover wherever there's ventilation or <laughs> anywhere that you can breathe through, which is your nose and your mouth. Make sure it's worn properly and covers everything properly. And uh, you don't, I, some people wear the masks and pull it down to speak and then worry back. That's not what is, that's not the whole idea. You're supposed to cover your mouth at all times, as long as you're around people. Um, use the two, make sure you're using the right side of the mask if it's, a, if it's not a cloth mask, because um, I think there's a part that's supposed to be inside. Just follow instructions when you buy these things and make sure it's done well. And for those of you who use cloth masks, um, make sure they are also sort of padded enough, to use the Nigerian term, uh, enough for you to breathe, but also strong enough not to let any sort of um, um, particles out of your mouth into the air. Because it's not enough that you just wear one layer, one layered mask, and then it's as good as not wearing anything. And we hear a lot about social distancing. It's one of those words that many of us heard for the first time this year. Uh, but it's also a very important term to continue to adhere to. Because whether you like it or not, 
we may not know a lot of things about this virus, but the one thing we know for sure is that getting in contact with somebody is the easiest way to catch it. And if you have to be out and you have to be around people, social distancing, we've heard, is the only way to sort of keep you safe. And what does that mean? Staying at least a meter away from anybody who's around you. Um, you can have conversations with someone. They don't have to be right in your face. You don't have to hold hands. You don't have to hug the person. You don't have to shake hands. Social distancing, I think it's... You can't preach that enough, with or without a mask, but most importantly, hopefully with a mask. But at least make sure you're keeping at least a meter, a meter's distance between you and whoever it is around you. That way, at least you can uh, be rest assured to an extent that you're keeping yourself safe. It's very, very important that you do that. Well, yeah, we've seen videos uh, a couple of days ago or weeks ago of people at banks who were struggling to get in. We've seen people at bus stops trying to get into buses or public transportation, even at markets. And it's a little troubling because, I mean, Lagos, for one, for example, has had its cases continue to spike. The numbers are not going down at all. And those seeing visuals like that makes you very worried. It makes you not sure how bad things are going to get or if things are going to get even worse. So it's important that we keep that in mind. Yes, we need to get by uh, 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 on a daily basis and, you know, get, get by with our things. But it's very important that we keep to the rules. We'll take a break now and be right back. All right, welcome back now. Like I said before the break, I'm being joined now by a comedian and online sensation celebrity, Anita. Uh, we all know her better as Real Worry Pekin, who continues to do great things online. Uh, Real Worry Pekin, how far? <laughs> Sorry, I need to turn this on. Um, so we're talking about, um, you know, um, the coronavirus... There's so much happening. And people like you are keeping us happy and entertained, you know, especially in these times. Uh, how are you yourself yeah. keeping yourself going? Because it's enough to make other people laugh and happy. But sometimes, we've heard so many times that comedians are sometimes the saddest people. You know, how are you keeping yourself going with each day? Yeah, it's not been easy, I must say, but um, we're just taking one day at a time, um, using this opportunity to work on myself, read books, bond with family, having me time and all of that. So we have no choice now. We're just taking one day at a time. So, but I mean, I know you live in Abuja, I believe. I know these are, these are very strange times for a lot of people. How has it been in Abuja for someone like you? I mean, you survive based on events. You know, you host events. You are up and about all the time. Abuja was locked down for over a month. Things are still not completely back to normal now. So with regards to like work and business, for people like you, how has it been? <laughs> Like, it's from moving from 100 to zero. Like, from, you know, from going out. There's no week I don't leave Abuja for events outside Nigeria, outside Abuja. And for a month plus, I've not even got to the airport. The only time I leave my gate is when I go for my radio show every Wednesday. It's been really bad. Like, what did God call us to do with all the duam? So now, now, the coronavirus, now, not the airports, the duan. We don't feed duan. What do we love to do? We know they feed the duan. You know what I'm But thank God for the online. We see they use the online lifestyle to the follow up if at all. It's not been easy. You able to make two back pocket touch now, based on saying that the going out, now they make system full. Normally, based on program money, you know what I'm But at the end of the day, God still have our back, launch back. We we'll still take one day at a time. Last, last, one day, everything could pick. <laughs> so um, there are people who believe that, um, you know, celebrities that it's at, in times like this um, owe it as a duty, you know, to take charge, you know, spread the gospel, do give away, you know, everybody wants, a cele wants celebrities to be in charge of situations like this. And on the one side, you can see why, because the people feel like there's a vacuum somewhere, maybe from government or whoever, and they need someone to fill it. And secondly, there are people who just believe celebrities should be role models or look up to celebrities for everything. So I guess my question is, how responsible do you feel in a time like this to do or to give? or to be a voice and um, do you feel pressure to do that yes i feel pressure you know say normally first of all 50 percent of nigerians they have this entitlement mentality they just be say as they be your fan or they follow you for instagram they, you owe them something 
You don't understand. So I've been pressured, though. I've been doing giveaway. A um, couple of days ago, I made a video telling small businesses that I want to support them. They should tag me on their business pages, and I'm going to repost. And I think I did it for, like, 10 different businesses. My DM blast now. Then they send me a message back to back. I don't repost 10 people on. People will never repost. They still don't have my feet. They scratch on. You know, so the pressure is really much. And the fact that they don't even know say they affect us. You know, so social, normally social media and make believe are plastic. If you really check well, many celebrities don't really get. They don't even nearly get safe. You know what I'm saying? So they still they try to see the other side. One, they still they help family. But fans no one agree. Before you go post one video, they don't reply. You say, do give away. Do give away. So the press are too much. I was shocked, say, I, I, I yes, say one big celebrity for Lagos, safe. Say, person request a uh, testify. Now the person drive come. So they don't write for everywhere. <laughs> You don't read everywhere, not today. <laughs> Look, I tell you now, I want musician who that he drives car carry person. They say show. They say how. They say don't read everybody. They also now, nah, not today. Celebrities <laughs> when they drop give away, they drop a camera for two days not page. You don't read, but they don't agree. Understand? Say the celebrity, the celebrity stood door. You don't put them on their side. So, do, are, are you worried? Are, are you worried? Are you worried for the industry you're working in entertainment? You know, the event industry, entertainment, the comedy industry, because you thrive, like I said, on being around people. And at a time like this, it's impossible to do that. Are you worried for, about the future of the industry? Because virtually everybody's affected: musicians, comedians, actors, whatever it is you're doing. Nothing can happen for a long time to come. Are you worried? I'm very worried. I'm extremely worried and I'm scared. At the end of the day, and we go affect pass. Because even though they say today, now, no pandemic again, everybody go back to normal. People go still dead traumatized. It go take people five years, four years, three years to even go shush, to even go gathering way past 20 people. So it's not even about the pandemic being over now. It's the mental, it's the mental torture and the, the trauma. So after the pandemic, it will take a while for people to adjust, you know. So it's really, it's really scary. I'm, 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 I'm scared. I'm, I'm scared. So, but I don't want to think I'm safe. I don't want to think I'm safe. Well, like, like but you too, said, people like you are sort of thriving now because you have a great online presence. You're able to be um, creative in times like this. Even though some people are yeah. complaining that even the creativity at some point is running out because sometimes you need to actually go out and interact to get more go material, out, to get more creative. So that is, is even being yeah. a problem sometimes. But for people who are looking for ways to, you know, sort of thrive in the online spaces like you are doing, you know, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, whatever it is, what are some tips you can give people? Because everybody is trying to look for what to do, even if not just to make money, but at least to get their minds off of, you know, the things around them. How should someone sort of get into that space and, you know, sort of tap into their creative juice? Um, do you mean the online comedians or inspiring ones? In creativity, comedy, music, whatever it is, how to just be, be sort of engage better on, online, if, if, if at all. Okay. <laughs> Normally, uh, this thing, it is their blood, though. If you're not the creative, you're not the creative. You guess the guy probably say, offline, they be blast. If they talk one or two now, points like you more laugh. But they all phone now, I mean, they start to talk for online. You know, peak. You know, understand? You know, peak. So, not be everybody feels strife for, for the online. I don't know how I think they do offline and and, and online. I would say it's the grace of God. But it go hard. People before the pandemic said, if most people we were able to do offline creativity, then they're able to try the online before the pandemic. So now with the pandemic don't come, eh? They they under pressure to even try to grow the online too. So the future they make some more progress come outside. But still they ask them. So but I think if you, if if they're not born you with something, it's not be talent, you feel learn them. So I think that they should read more, study about it. Go YouTube, Google is your friend. Just just all body, all body at the end of the day. It's gonna be really hard. It's gonna be hard, but they, they just have to try.
Very true. Finally, one sentence very quickly. I know you're a mother as well. You have two children. A lot of parents are tired, you know. Yeah. They've not spent this much time with their children, being stuck <laughs> and answering 600 questions a day. Any tips for parents going through this time? Because, I mean, some people feel like maybe you're a comedian, so maybe you're, your children are laughing throughout the day. I don't know if that's what's happening. But how do we keep our children happy oh. and entertained in a time like this? <laughs> Trust me, this is the longest I've stayed with my kids since I had them. It's really not easy. But I'll just tell parents to take advantage of this opportunity. Take advantage of it. The pandemic is going to end and they're going to go back to school. Just take advantage of it. See the brighter side of it. Just enjoy it. It's not easy, but you get the time where you say you'll tell yourself. If you tell yourself, say, do this thing, you go work. It's not easy, but just try. Some parents will not know their children class before. Find out their class with a day now. Ask them questions. What's the name of your classmate? Your best friend? Try to know your picky because trust me, so can't you come up for money? Other nine to five parents. They know even they know their picky uniform. Their picky name of school said they forget. They'll get steam camp for like five hours before they remember. So now with the children day, more just use and tell your bond, have fun, learn, and get to know our kids. Thank because you very much. Solution. They're not gonna park, go outside. You know, if you park, leave them. So you have to make it work and be patient with them. Thank you very much, Anita. Please follow her on Instagram at Real Worry Picking. Um, very, very talented and good luck with everything you do. And please stay safe, stay safe, stay safe with you and your family, all right? Thanks for joining us today. Yes. But like I always say, you can follow the conversation on Twitter at Robin Minds Now is the handle. Please use the hashtag Robin Minds when you tweet at us. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you next Sunday.